Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Thursday Night in the Word. We appreciate you being with us, and and uh, what a what a uh, great opportunity for us to um, dig into the Word just a little bit. Um, we're trying to keep these um, Thursday nights to around 30 minutes. I can't say that I always am successful at that. But it is something that we're trying to do. And we just appreciate you taking time out to uh, join with us and to be a part of what we're doing. I, again, I believe that it's emphasized in the scripture for us to study, for prepare, to prepare ourselves, to be ready to give an answer uh, when asked. And also to make sure that we establish everything upon rightly dividing the word of truth. And I think if we do that... Um, we're going to come to a place to where we are representing more and more the truth of God's Word, not adding to or taking away from. And so um, uh, we appreciate you being with us tonight. And uh, Father, I just thank you so much for each one that's uh, tuned in with us and um, that's watching. And we just ask that you touch their hearts, open their ears and their eyes and Help us to see and to hear what you have to say to us and what you're doing. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for all that you're doing. Give us understanding. And God, I pray, baptize us with power from on high for these last days that we would be um, led and directed by your Holy Spirit. Um, Lord, that all the things that we do would be spirit-led, spirit-motivated. And Lord, that we would be empowered um, for your service, to witness to all those that are around us, to let our light shine. Um, Lord, you said, as we talked about um, last week, out of our bellies shall flow rivers of living water. Um, and you were speaking to them and us concerning the Holy Spirit, who at that time had not yet been given. But now you have given to us the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And God, we just pray, help us to be saturated and satiated in the presence of God and help us to allow the Holy Spirit to just overwhelm us and fill us and flood out of us that we can touch other people's lives. Give us revelation and open our eyes so we can see. Lord, we thank you today and bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're talking about the doctrine of baptisms and we've already covered water baptism. We we started last week talking about um, the baptism of the Holy Spirit and how that we are baptized um, with the Holy Spirit, baptized into the Holy Spirit, and we experience that after salvation. We also talked about Old Testament regeneration because a lot of times people think that um, our forefathers were saved by the works of the law, but yet the Bible tells us that no man can be saved by the works of the law. And it was accounted unto Abraham um, uh, through his faith as righteousness. Abraham looked for a builder, building and a builder and maker of a city um, who was God. And we know he didn't experience that in his lifetime, but yet um, he still believed, he still had faith and trusted that um, God was going to perform what he said. And so we, we've been talking about how that um, the Holy Spirit baptism was predicted and promised uh, in the scriptures and uh, read, read all those scriptures last week and talked about how that, you know, the scripture teaches us that, you know, the Lord is going, was going to change um, how uh, the Holy Spirit and, or where the Holy Spirit dwelt. Uh, we saw in John 7, 37 through 39, he tells them that the Holy Spirit had been with you, but now going forward, he was going to be in you. So he commanded them to go and tarry in Jerusalem and wait until they were a dude with power from on high. And so today we want to begin to look at a record of the Holy Spirit baptism being received uh, in the scriptures. Uh, the scripture that I just referenced, Luke 24, 49 says, And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Um, Jesus wanted them to go and to tarry and wait. So we need to remember when we're looking at 
um, the Holy Spirit being received, we need to remember that um, the Gospels are a record of God's will and the book of Acts is the doing of God's will. And if you want to establish your theology on how the Holy Spirit baptism is to be received and what its results should be, then you have to look and study the book of Acts, not the Gospels. The Gospels were before the Holy Spirit was given, but its message included the promise of the Holy Spirit. And so when we look at how the Holy Spirit came to be in the, the disciples' lives, we have to go to the book of Acts. Jesus um, talked about the will of God. He talked about and predicted what was going to happen to them. Um, but the fulfillment of that came in the book of Acts. And so we want to make sure that we look into the book of Acts and we're going to be talking about um, those scriptures on how that they had received the Holy Spirit. A um, lot of different terms and um, that were used synonymously with the baptism in the Holy Spirit. It also talks about the promise of the Father. It talks about baptized in the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit has come upon you. The gift of the Holy Spirit received the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit fell upon them. Um, but when we look at Acts chapter 1, 4, and 5, it says, while, And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. Which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized you with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. In Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4, the scripture shows us exactly what happened that Jesus was speaking about. It says, and when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. Then suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. It was not a language that they learned. It was not a school that they went to to learn about this. But the Bible says they began to speak as the Holy Spirit came upon them and filled them. They began to speak. They began to speak as the Spirit gave them the utterance. And how did they receive? The Bible teaches us that as we had therefore received Christ Jesus, so walk in him. How did I receive Christ Jesus? By faith. How did they receive um, Christ Jesus? By faith. How did they receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? By faith. And so their faith arose, and as he came upon them, they began to speak that utterance that he gave them, just like you and I as when we were children. And our parents would begin to speak to us over and over and over words. And we would begin to repeat those words. Not because um, we fully understood, but because we made the same sounds and started to make the same sounds as they made as they gave us the utterance. Then they went further and they started giving to us um, phrases and sentences and different things of that nature until we began to fluently be able to communicate with them. Same way with this, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives them the utterance, gives to us the utterance, and we by faith speak out that utterance as he gives it. We do not understand what it says, what he's saying through us. We just know that he has filled us. In Acts chapter 2, 38, 39, and Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord God calls to himself. It's not just for a few. It's not just for them back then. It's not just for that day and time, as many people teach today. But he says it's for you, your children, and for all those who will call on the Lord or that God will call to himself. In the book of Acts, eight, chap, chapter 8, verse 15 through 17, it says, Who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit? For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Acts 10 um, 44 through 47. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. 
And the believers were among the from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? Acts 19 and 6. When Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. Prophesying. So we can see that in the book of Acts, as we went along there, each time that the Holy Spirit was poured out, they began to speak in tongues, or the statement is made that they had received the Holy Spirit even as they had received the Holy Spirit. We can see that a lot of times they had repented and cried out to God for the forgiveness of sins, and then they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, and then later on prayed for and received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Then we saw also where they were um, prayed for. The Bible says that they had given their hearts to Jesus Christ, their, that they had received him and believed in him for the remission of their sins, and they received the Holy Spirit. And then after that, they had been taken out and were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So we can see here that as the Holy Spirit is poured out on individuals, we understand and we know that the Holy Spirit was a separate experience from their salvation. And so we, we want to make sure we understand that. Um, but um, let's take a look at just for a minute some hindrances to people receiving the Holy Spirit baptism because I believe that if someone starts out an adventure in the Word of God to study out the Word of God concerning the baptism of the Holy Spirit and they rightly divide the truth, they will come to the same conclusion as what we're speaking to you about today. In the book of Acts, when they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they spoke with other tongues. All the way through the scripture. The will, the, the will of God was um, talked about in the gospels, but the will of God was acted out and done in the book of Acts. And so how do we see them doing it? The Holy Spirit came upon them, covered them, filled them, and they began to speak in other tongues. But yet we know that today, hindrances to receiving the Holy Spirit baptism are out there. Many Christians today do not receive the Holy Spirit baptism because they have received um, for themselves the doctrine and the traditions and commandments of men. Um, Mark um, chapter 7, verse 7 through 9 teaches us that in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandments of God in order to establish your tradition. I, I don't know about you, but that's not how I want to um, walk out my faith in Christ. I, I don't want to just be taught the tradition of men or the traditions of an organization or a system. I want to know what thus saith the word of the Lord. I want everything to be proven in the mouth of two or three witnesses. I want to know what the word of God says to me and what every promise that God says is mine. I want to know what it says so I can lay hold of it. And besides that, I believe that this baptism of the Holy Spirit is another part of the process of our salvation. It is bringing us into a place that we have power for service, power to witness, power to walk out this life through the power of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit working in our lives. If we've ever needed the gifts of the Spirit to operate, it is today. If we've ever needed the spirit of discernment to operate, it is today. If we've ever in our lives needed the word of knowledge to operate, it's today. Or the, the word of wisdom, or the gift of tongues and interpretation of tongues, it, it is today. The gift of faith, the gift of healing, the gift of miracles, it is today. We need the power of God working in our lives today. Spirits are at work all around us, and today the church needs to be empowered 
by the Holy Spirit, not by the traditions of men, but by his presence. He says it. It's not by might. It's not by power. But it's by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And so even though there is much disputing going on in Christendom concerning the Holy Spirit baptism, all do agree that such a bad t- baptism does exist. Therefore, each church has to form some theological doctrine and stance on this issue. Many form their doctrinal stance on experience and previous indoctrination rather than on the written word of God. What are we to listen to today? Are we to go by experiences? Are we to just go by emotion or, or just experiences of the past? Or, or are we to operate on what we have been indoctrinated with? Um, are we to be parrots of what other people have spoken to us? Or are we to dig deep into the word of God to find out what thus saith the word of the Lord? We are to dig deep, I believe. And that's what God is commanding us to do today. Some people erroneously conclude and assume that since the Holy Spirit baptizes us into the body of Christ and they are in the body of Christ, they must have already received the Holy Spirit baptism. But when we look at the scripture, 1 Corinthians 12, 12 and 13 tells us, for just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of of that body Though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we are all baptized into one body. Jews and Greeks, slaves and, and free are free. And all were made to drink of that one same spiritual drink. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 12 and 13 tells us <clears throat> that it is the Holy Spirit that baptizes us into the body of Christ. We have all been baptized into the general body of Christ. And we talked about this before. That also, too, I believe the Spirit leads us, guides us, helps us, and directs us into being a part of and committing ourselves to a local expression of that general body of Christ. I can't be a member of every church in Elizabethtown. I can't be a part of every church in Elizabethtown helping them to perpetuate their vision. But the Holy Spirit brought me to Bethesda. This is where he wants me to operate. This is where he has set me in in order that I might use the gifts and talents of God to help to see that whatever portion or part of um, God's plan Bethesda has, that I help to fulfill it. And then also help to assist any of the others that I might be able to when the time and opportunity arises. But yet when we think about this baptism into the body of Christ. Again, the Holy Spirit is the one who baptizes us into the body. But when we're talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it is Jesus Christ who is baptizing us into the Holy Spirit, with the Holy Spirit. Preconceived ideas and faulty teachings have kept many Christians from receiving a very important and valuable part of a threefold provision that Jesus died to secure for all believers. It is important for us not to allow anything to keep us from the promise of God. Jesus said, I'm going to send to you the promise of the Father. I'm going to go to the Father and I'm going to pray to him. And, 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 and through my prayer, the Father is going to send to you the baptism of the, of the Holy Spirit. You will be endued with power from on high and you will be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. He said, this is so important for you to receive. Do not leave Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Wow. I I think about that sometimes, and I wonder to myself, how much more were they needing? They had just spent at least three years, if not three and a half years, with Jesus Christ himself, (laughs) being taught the power of God's word, being taught the truth, of God's word, spending time with the truth, the anointed one, God in the flesh. I mean, they were, they were more equipped and more ready for what was coming into their lives than any person in history. Here these individual men were, these women that also followed along, they had, they, they had more 
uh, equipping than people who have every type of acronym behind their name that you can think of. Some people have four or five doctorates behind their name. But I want to tell you what, they aren't and were not as equipped as the disciples were because they had spent time with the master themselves. But yet Jesus wanted them to know it is expedient for you to go and tarry in Jerusalem and wait until you be endued with power from on high. Why? Because it was the Holy Spirit that was going to bring back to their remembrance all that Jesus had instructed them and taught them. It was the Holy Spirit that was going to inspire them and guide their hands as they wrote down the letters in the New Testament for you and I to read today and that was passed around throughout all the regions in their day and time. It was that Holy Spirit that was going to anoint them with power as they went and they broke new ground all throughout the regions of this world. The Bible says that they were men and women that went into every city and in every city they turned those cities upside down for God. Not by might, not by power, but by His Spirit they did the mighty works of Jesus Christ, which Jesus told us. Greater works shall you do than even I have done. What was he talking about? What can be greater than raising the dead? What can be greater than opening blinded eyes? What can be greater than setting the captives free, casting out demons, unstopping deaf ears, making the lame to walk again? What can be greater than those things? What can be greater than forgiving somebody their sins? Which Jesus did, which caused them to think he was a blasphemer. What can be greater than those things? So we cannot say that we think that Jesus was speaking to us uh, uh, about us doing more magnificent works than what he did. But what he was talking about was that thou, this body of Christ, these members of his body would multiply and they would all be filled with the Holy Spirit and power and they would go throughout the whole earth doing these great and powerful works, unlocking with the keys that he gave them, unlocking the truths of the kingdom of God. It's important for us not to be hindered by traditions of men or, again, doctrines that we have has been embedded in our hearts dig into the scripture and find out what the scripture teaches us what about the holy spirit baptism uh, being a separate experience um, one of the most effective weapons satan uses to keep christians from receiving the holy spirit baptism is to make them believe they already have it if they think they have it they won't seek it if they don't seek it, they won't receive it. And so it's not an automatic gift through the new birth. Another hindrance to receiving the Holy Spirit baptism is that Christians do not like to believe they are inadequate in their present condition or level of commitment. Nobody wants to believe that they are inadequate in doing what God has called them to do. We're not trying to try to speak out to anybody. But I do believe that people that are living without the baptism of the Holy Spirit are living below their privileges as, as priests and king, kingdoms people in God's kingdom today. I believe that people that are living without the baptism of the Holy Spirit are living as those saints did who were in the Old Testament. They've had their sins forgiven. They, they are moving forward and trying to do the very best they can and walking this out. But yet, that superior provision that was given to us through Jesus Christ giving us the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we are walking without and we do not have to. We do not have to. Therefore, people re re maintain they already have it. As we continue this study, let's lay aside every preconceived idea and with an open mind allow the written word to speak um, what it wants and, fo and form its doctrine in our hearts. Let's let the word of God speak to us. Can we conclude on the basis of the word that believers receive the Holy Spirit baptism upon regeneration? The following scriptural arguments should prove this to be untrue and that the Holy Spirit baptism is in fact as much a separate experience in addition to salvation as water baptism is. Let's look at a few examples. 
The Bible teaches us the disciples were saved before the day of Pentecost. Luke chapter 10, 17 through 20 says, The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said unto them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing, nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, listen, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names have been written in heaven. So we know that these disciples were already believers. In John chapter 20, um, 19 through 20, he says to us, On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Listen, not only, not only were they saved before the day of Pentecost, not only were they born again, not only were their sins forgiven, but I want to tell you something. They didn't just hear about the plan of salvation. They saw it. They saw the plan of salvation. If we just stop there, to me, that would be enough. But let's keep going. The Samaritans became believers and were baptized in water and later received the Holy Spirit baptism, Acts chapter 8, 12 through 18. And when they believed Philip, as he preached good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip. And seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. And when the, the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When do you get baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus? After you repent. And so here they were, they had repented, they had believed, they had been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And it says, and then Peter and John laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money. He offered them money. He saw the Holy Spirit had been given to them through the laying on of hands. The evidence was there, as we've seen before, the evidence and talked about before, the evidence, the initial evidence of receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit was speaking in other tongues. Saul, let's look at another example. Here's Saul, who we know as Paul. In Acts chapter 9, 10 through 18, Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he has seen a vision, a man named Ananias, come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. Because we all know Paul on the on the on the road to Damascus, had an experience with God, knocked off his ride, and was blinded there. And God directed him to the street called Straight that a man by the name of Ananias would come and pray for him that he might receive his sight. But Ananias answered and said, Lord, I have heard from many about this man how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. You know, just a side note here. Isn't this interesting? Um... You know, we talk about prayer and we make our petitions known to God and we may pray for 30 minutes and we wind up speaking 28 of those 30 minutes and then we say, okay, God, what do you think? But if, did you notice how in this passage here, this, this is a conversation between Ananias and the Lord. Now, I know people will think we're crackpots if we start talking like this. But I want you to know the reason why the early church was so powerful because Jesus may have bodily left 
and gone back and sit at the right hand of the Father. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, he was with them and he was carrying on conversations with them. Lord, I've heard so many things about this man, how much evil he has done in your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is chosen instrument of mine to carry uh, my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed, as the Lord said, and entered the house, and laying his hands on, on, on him on the one that uh, the Lord had talked about, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell off from his eyes. He gained his sight. Then he, ro uh, he rose and was baptized. Wow. Paul on the road to Damascus had believed. His sins was forgiven him. He was obedient to the, com the conversation of the Lord directing him to the street called Straight and had been shown that Ananias was going to come and was going to pray for him and heal him. And, and here he is now following all that, now receiving something separate from what he had already received called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Let's don't stop there. Let's keep going. The Ephesian disciples, Acts chapter 18, 20 through 28. After spending some time there, he departed and went from one place to the next through the region of Galatia and Pergia, strengthening all the disciples. Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus, who was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he, when, and when he wished to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those who, through grace, had believed. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that that Christ was Jesus, Acts 19, 1 through 7. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples, and he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, they didn't say, Well, no, Paul, we haven't believed yet. No, they said, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into, then when, and, and, and into what then were you baptized? They said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him. That is Jesus. On hearing this from Paul, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. They were about 12 men in all. Whew, that's powerful. That's powerful. That's for you and us today. Ephesians 1 through 13, 1, 13 says, in whom, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promise of, of the Holy Spirit. I, I mean, that's that's a powerful um, passage of Scripture. Cornelius, let's let's don't forget Cornelius, Acts 10, 44 through 48. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers were among the circumcised who had come with Peter, were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, because of what you see, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? How did they receive it? By speaking in other tongues as the initial evidence. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. 
Acts 11, 12 through 18. And the Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. Now what's he doing here? In this passage of Scripture here in Acts 11, Peter now is no longer Cornelius' house. He's back in Jerusalem um, with the brothers, and he's having to give an explanation of his ministry because here he is talking to them about the Gentiles receiving Christ. And so he's having to give an answer, accountability, to those who are over him or who are laboring with him in the Lord. And he says, And the Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. These six brothers also accompanied me, accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen the angel stand in his house and say, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will declare to you the message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. And, and as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit, because they were already believing in obedience to Christ, he says the Holy Spirit fell on them just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us, when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard these things, they fell silent and they glorified God saying, then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. Last but not least, Jesus endorsed the Holy Spirit baptism as a separate experience in his own teaching. Luke 11, 11 through 13 says, When what father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? How do we receive? We ask. How do we ask? In the name of Jesus, by faith. You being evil will not give bad things to your kids. God will not give bad things to us when we ask him in the name of Jesus for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Then again, John 7, 37 through 39, Jesus speaks on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Again, who's he speaking to? He's speaking to his disciples and those that were gathered there. He was speaking to people that were already his followers. Now it says in verse 39, Now this he said about the Spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified was not yet glorified. John chapter 14, 12 through 17, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do and greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you. He's already been working on you. He's already been working in your life. He's brought you to regeneration. He's brought you to faith. He dwells with you, but he will be in you. I, I in, in the several instances that the receiving of the Holy Spirit baptism is recorded in the New Testament, it was a separate experience other than regeneration. There is not one single instance in the entire Bible where the Holy Spirit baptism is equated with salvation. A lot of people teach today that um, the Holy Spirit baptism is equated with salvation, and we want you to know that we do not believe that here. Salvation is through faith by the grace of God. Holy Spirit baptism comes after someone has repented 
of their sins and has been forgiven of their sins. Then the Holy Spirit comes and makes his residence within them. There is not one single instance in the entire Bible that is equated with salvation. The scriptures do not teach that salvation would come after the Holy Spirit came upon them, but rather power to be a witness. The early church experienced the Holy Spirit baptism and demonstrated the power. Now, I do believe in a lot of Pentecostal churches, it's a lot of emotional outbursts. And I understand why people are skeptical of the baptism of the Holy Spirit because of what they have seen and what they have also heard out of Pentecostals and Charismatics. We've seen a lot of charismatic mumbo jumbo. We've seen a lot of disruptive circus type things that have gone on in churches all down through our history. But I want to tell you something. Listen, um, just because some people only walk in an emotional outburst, only because some people want to um, uh, over um, take over in a service with speaking in tongues where there is no interpretation, does not disqualify or do away with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We need to walk it out right. Paul said, I would that you would um, speak um, one word in a known tongue than a thousand in, the, in an unknown tongue. He wasn't criticizing or, or, or turning people against the baptism of the Holy Spirit or speaking in other tongues. He was just saying in our corporate worship services, if somebody is going to speak out in tongues to where everybody is noticing it, then there should be an interpretation to that that's being spoken, which is one of the nine spiritual gifts of tongues and interpretation of tongues. It doesn't mean that somebody cannot speak in tongues and, and, and allow the Holy Spirit to use them in their worship as they worship God, but not in a way in which it takes over unless there is an interpretation. Paul says to you, I would that you all spoke with tongues. I speak in tongues more than all of you. We're going to be talking about more of that. But I want us to try to open up our minds and hearts right now to see that this is something for us, that God has to empower us for service. Thank you so much today for being with us. We hope that you receive something out of that. Next week we will continue on with um, the doctrine of baptisms and talk more about the Holy Spirit baptisms, have tongues ceased. Join with us next week. Be with us. Make sure that you like and share um, this um, broadcast so others can also see it. And we thank you. We pray for you. We ask the Holy Spirit to touch your life and to baptize you with power. Because right where you're sitting, you can lift up your hands to the Lord and you can say in the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, baptize me right now. Jesus, baptize me in the Holy Spirit with the initial evidence of speaking other tongues and he will do it. We have not because we ask not. God bless you today and may the Lord continue to lead and guide your path. God bless.